Hi, and welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about tick and flea medication. Particularly, we're going to look at the different kinds. We're going to look at how they work and the effect they have on our pets. And we're also going to see why they can be extremely dangerous for us and for our pets. I usually try to go with a more natural source, but there are two instances where I actually had to use commercial tick and flea medication. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Nicole. I'm a pet nutrition specialist, animal osteopath and homeopath, and I am the passionate pet mama of my dog Iberia and my cats Britannia and Caledonia. You may see them throughout the video. They sometimes come and do a little kitty or doggy cameos. Before we start, a small disclaimer. If you're doing your research on tick and flea medication and that's how you landed on this video, then I'm sure that you know that tick and flea medication are very controversial. There are many veterinarians who believe they are perfectly safe and others that look at the evidence and show that they can be very, very deleterious to our animal's health to the point of bringing them to death. I personally feel that commercial tick and flea medication are really dangerous to our pets. There have been multiple studies, we're going to go through some of them here, that have seen that they can negatively impact your pet's health even to the point of killing them. So you really want to thread carefully, which is why I decided to make this video. And before we get into the five main families of tick and flea medication, I wanted to mention what some of the side effects can be. So let me read them off to you. So vomiting, diarrhea, itching, seizures, behavioral changes, liver disease, hemorrhaging, neurologic problems, and death. Obviously, some of these are very extreme, and I was wondering, what is the likelihood of my dog actually dying? Well, actually, it can be as likely as one in three. Let's look at what the different families are and what their mechanism of actions are. So there are five big families of commercial tick and flea medication. It's important to know which medication belongs to which family because if you notice that your pet, your dog or cat had a reaction to one of them, then you can look at what the mechanism of action is and what family they belong to and then go ahead and the next time that you really have to use it, go ahead and use a different family that uses a different mechanism of action. The first family we're going to talk about are the neonicotinoids. They are Advantage, Advantix, Vectra, Capstar, and the Cerresto collars. Obviously, Advantage, Advantix, and Vectra are spot-on products. Then you have Capstar, which is uh, chewable, and then you have the Cerresto collar. They work by disrupting acetylcholine receptors, and they cause the paralysis of the bug and eventually death. I'm sure you've heard of some of these, they're very common, and because they're so common, they actually are the major pollutants that we are finding in our wildlife. The biggest impact has been on the bee population. They seem to impact their behavior, so they struggle with getting pollen and there is higher mortality. It seems to be caused by neonicotinoids actually impacting bees' immune systems and making them more susceptible to viruses that they would naturally be resistant to. There have also been additional studies that have shown that other wildlife is also being affected by the presence of so many many neonicotinoids in the environment. The next family is phenopyrazoles, also fipronil, which is the main ingredient in Frontline. Now, obviously, it's a spot-on product, and it works by impacting GABA receptors and actually causing seizures and eventually the death of the bugs that bite your dog and cat. Now, because GABA is a neurotransmitter that's present in the nervous system of mammals as well, it can actually impact us and our animals. And it has been shown that dog and cats who regularly receive spot-on treatment with fipronil, so frontline, will actually have serotonin and dopamine levels that are completely off the charts. Additionally, a recent study in the UK has seen that fipronil is the number one pollutant in English rivers. They think because people bring their dogs to the river to play, which, I mean, obviously it's fantastic, but obviously if they have frontline on them, the frontline will get diluted in the water and it's affecting the invertebrate population of the rivers. So much so that they've seen a reduction of 75% in the number of invertebrates over two generations, which for invertebrates, that can be as easy as in two years. I always try to be very mindful of the impact that I have on my environment, and these studies were really disturbing. The next family we're going to look at is spinosads, or conformis and trifexis. Both of them are chewable tablets. And spinosads actually work on the acetylcholine receptor, just like neonicotinoids, so they cause the seizure and death of bugs after they bite your animal. Spinosads are actually really interesting because they come from a natural bacteria, Saccharopolyspora, which grows on the roots of sugar canes. And it was actually given organic status in 2003. What's really interesting is that this bacteria, when fermented, will actually produce a biological pesticide called spinosads. And that's where spinosads come from. The fourth family is macrocytic lactones. The commercial name is Revolution. Revolution is a spot-on product and it works by impacting the GABA receptors. The fifth family is 
Isoxazoline. The commercial names are Bravecto, Nexgard, Symparica, and Cradalio. They are all chewable tablets, and they act on GABA and glutamate receptors. Now, these particularly have been in the news. A study just came out showing that two out of three animals are impacted by these and will actually have side effects. And of these two out of three animals that do have symptoms, one will have mild to moderate symptoms, but one will actually have moderate to severe, and it can also cause death. What is particularly scary to me about many of these commercial pesticides from all of the family is that some of the symptoms that they can get, such as seizures, can actually become a lifelong problem. So it's not that you stop giving the medication and your dog and cat goes back to their previous self. For some of these, once they actually start reacting, they will continue having those problems for the rest of their lives. What makes this even more complicated and what makes the discussion a little bit more complicated is that many of our animals do not start reacting right away and sometimes they don't even start reacting after the first dose. Sometimes it takes two or three doses and it can take four, five, six weeks, two months for animals to actually start showing symptoms. Why? Because all of these are metabolized in the liver. So it takes a while for the liver to actually get overwhelmed and to start showing symptoms of fatigue and then for the symptoms to actually start showing up. And this is what makes it so challenging to actually diagnose and report these reactions because obviously it's difficult to connect something that happens maybe six weeks later or maybe happens after the third time you've given something and you just assumed the first two times you had no issues. So it could not be that molecule but it actually is. So how do we know if our dogs or cats are going to react to some of these medications? And the reality is we don't know because all of our cats and dogs and us as well, we're all different, we're slightly different. And what might be okay for one organism and one liver might just be that tad bit too much for another which will cause symptoms. So it's really up to us as pet owners to do our homework, to find veterinarians that we trust and who are willing to work with us and to really offer the right solutions for our animals based on their situations. And that's basically what I wanted to do with this series. As I've mentioned, all of these pesticides are metabolized in the liver. So that's one of the things that I always look at when I do my yearly wellness check with Iberia and my cats. I do blood draws and I check all of their values and I also keep their liver values in mind so that I always know, should I have to, for some reason, give a medicine that's a little bit more heavy on their organism that I know that the liver is doing well and that I can make an educated choice. So the majority of people who are for tick and flea medication for the animal say, you know, how else can I keep tick and fleas off of my animal? I don't want my dog or cat to come down with tick-borne diseases. They're really scary and they're really dangerous. And I agree with them. But the problem is that these medicines don't actually keep ticks and fleas off of your animals. Let me explain they don't actually repel them. What happens is the tick or flea will get on your dog and cat and they will bite them and get a blood meal. Because these medications are absorbed and are in your dog and cat's bloodstream, when tick and fleas get their blood meal, they will also take in the pesticide and then the pesticide will eventually kill them and they will fall off. Now, how fast does it kill them? Well, it really depends. Sometimes it can kill them as fast as two hours. Sometimes it can take up to 48 hours. The problem is, is that these ticks and fleas actually get to take a blood meal. So they actually have the time to inject some of their saliva into your dog and cat, and they actually have the chance to infect your dog and cat if they themselves were infected with some of the diseases that they carry. So unfortunately, these really dangerous medicines don't actually truly protect your dog and cat from tick-borne diseases. And what gets me about them is, did you know that technically we should be wearing gloves when we are giving these chewables or spot-ons or when we're touching the collar that we're putting on our animals? And did you know that if you actually touch them, the medicines, you are supposed to go through a detox protocol. There are several detox protocols to make sure that these pesticides are not going to harm you and your organism. And I'm sorry, but it's like, excuse me, I'm going to get detox, but I can definitely put it on my animal every month or every three months, depending. And of course, we are seeing now that there are serious reaction and serious consequences to using these products. So as far as I'm concerned, if it's not okay for me, it's definitely not okay for my animals. But with that said, there are two instances where I had to use these on my animals. And I wanted to talk to you about them to kind of give you a little bit of a way of thinking of things. 
And as I'm telling you the story, Iberia decided to do a little cameo. <laughs> so the first time that I decided to use a tick medication on Iberia I had just come back from um, vacation and she had gotten into a tick nest and she was covered in ticks. So I went through my usual natural routine and it just was not powerful enough because she was literally covered in tiny, tiny, tiny ticks. So I decided to go ahead and give her tick medication. Now I knew that her liver values were good and this was going to be a one-time thing. And after I gave her the tick medication, I actually went through a little bit of a liver detail talks so that she would get a little bit of support. The second time I had to use tick and flea medication, it was on Iberia and on the cats and the problem was fleas. So apparently here in Germany, there are a lot of hedgehogs and they have fleas and will come to your yard and will bring the fleas in during the winter because they obviously come closer to the house because it's a little bit warmer. So Iberia was bringing fleas home and that's a huge issue because Caledonia, my cat, is extremely allergic to tick bite and she will you know, start scratching and she'll start losing her fur. It's, it's a huge problem. So I tried to deal with it naturally for a couple of days and I realized that it just was not going to help. So I ended up going and giving all three of my animals, so my two cats and my dog, I take on flea medication. Other than that, I haven't had to use chemical pesticides and I have done really well with some of my recipes that I kind of tweaked. Each time I have to give a pesticide, I kind of tweak the recipe to see if I can prevent it. And as a matter of fact, we haven't had the need to use chemical pesticides since then. I do believe in using natural options first before resorting to chemical pesticides. I think you need to look at your specific dog and cat in your specific situation and kind of adapt and use all of the tools that you have to the best of your ability. And that's basically what I do with me and my animals. If you're interested to see how I set up the protocols for my animals and what some of my recipes are that have been very, very helpful, then I'm going to link them in the next video. Thank you for watching us. It's been a pleasure. Give your dog and cat a kiss from us and we'll see you in the next one. Bye!